I've I've always just wanted to draw comics. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's my favorite thing to do. Lounge and sun. A very special interview for you guys to check out. I'm interviewing Jaime Hernandez of Love and Rockets fame. Welcome, Jaime. Thank, thanks for having me. Before we get into the interview, I just wanted to ask, how have you been staying busy during these uh, trying times? You know, like, I mean, I know you, you're you a cartoonist, so obviously you're drawing and writing, right? Um, yeah. But how else have you been staying busy? I give myself, uh, you know, like, like errands to do, you know, like go out, get groceries one day, you know, go, yeah, just all that stuff. No, um, I'm home a lot anyway, you know, so it's not as bad as it is for some people who have to just have to get out to the beach 24 hours a day, you know. <laughs> You've had such a long and celebrated career. I mean, I, I've never heard anything but good stuff and made, like high, high praise, you know, going back to when I was a kid and I didn't even know what Love and Rockets was. Mm-hmm. I, I remember the names, you know, and I wanted to start at the beginning. What was what was the catalyst for you and your brothers to self-publish and produce your own book? Uh, ba- basically, it's, it's pretty simple. But basically, we were just kind of tired of what we were seeing in comics. You know, we started to outgrow a lot of the Marvel stuff. Um, and uh, we always drew comics ourselves. And uh, one day, one of our brothers said, you know, why don't you just make your own, you know? And we're like, yeah, we have been making our own. He goes, why don't you publish your own comic? And uh, we said, okay, you know. Um, I had no idea how, what, what the, the uh, industry was like and how to sell, sell it, you know. But um, it... Uh, you know, we we just did it. We we made our own. We were kind of pretty naive about the, the industry, and and but luckily, uh, Fantagraphics picked us up pretty quick. Cool. So when you guys were selling that, that first issue, because I think issue two is you were already through Fantagraphics, correct? Yeah, yeah. No, we we did a, a an expanded number one with them. You know, it mm-hmm. was uh, we just used what was in the original and uh, added to it you know so number one is half the original uh comic you know oh, okay. with Fan- the one with fanographics yeah and then two was the next and it's been you know that way ever since <laughs> <laughs> speaking of um issue two there was a lot more sci-fi elements to the love and rockets in the beginning right mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. what made you decide to jump away from that and tell more of the slice of life, you know, the punk scenes and stuff like that. Because obviously, I mean, sci-fi was probably a huge influence, I'd imagine, at a young age, that which is why you put it in your comics. But I was wondering, like, why the change? Yeah. Um, well, uh, when we did the first issue, we kind of threw our whole lives in it, you know, stuff we were into since we were little kids. And... and um, um, when we put that in, um, I started to like doing the characters more than the backdrops, you know, I, mm-hmm. and I, I thought a lot that was going on in my life, you know, in my neighborhood was just, uh, very interesting to tell, you know, I had a lot of stories to tell of my home life and and at the time, this was what early '80s, so uh, a lot of people didn't know what it was life was like in Southern California, because um, what you got on TV and stuff was basically beach, the beach world, you know, and and Baywatch, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, you know, we grew up in a Mexican neighborhood. We, uh, you know, got into punk. I was I was into low riding for a while, you know. Um, and uh, I just thought that was really good stories to tell. And the the rocket ships got in the way after a while. And and I took we took it on ourselves to like, well, we're going to make a comic about normal people and we're going to do our best for people to like it without the trappings, you know, just to, just to do normal life stuff and make it interesting. And we took that 
kind of challenge, you know, because if we would have stayed with the science fiction stuff, I would have enjoyed it, but we would have been just another science fiction comic, you know. So we yeah. kind of took took a chance and said, well, we want to do something different here, you know. And and the, the fans stayed with us, so that, that's lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, and um, I wanted to talk a little bit before we get into like into Maggie and Hopi, which I definitely want to talk about. But I I know two of your influences are Harry Lucy, his Archie work, mm -hmm. and um, Hank Ketchum's The Dennis in Hawaii. I've, I've I've heard it or seen it in interviews before, and I was wondering what about their work stood out the most to you, and how did it become so influential? When there's I mean, there's so many comics coming out even at that time, you know, like, but those two artists I picked from multiple interviews and I wanted to know what about them stood out. Yeah. Most. Um, well, you know, I, I liked all kinds of comics, superhero comics uh, uh, and Archie comics and Dense the Menace comics, you know, grew up with all that stuff. And uh, um, pretty, the older I got, I was reading kind of the same old comics, you know, over and over again. And and there was these two guys that stood out. This one artist that ghosted for uh, Dennis the Menace, named Owen Fitzgerald, and then Harry Lucy and Dan DiCarlo doing Archie stuff. I really liked their uh, kind of slice of life stuff. They would draw like, you know, I don't know, like home life stuff. You know, mm -hmm. and but the these artists were very even if they were ghosting the styles of those comics, they were you could tell they were really good, good uh, uh, storytellers underneath. You know, the, of their own, so uh -huh. they brought out they brought out the stuff real like uh, like more than the other artists. I could just sense like I, I feel like there's real people in, inside of this or there's good actors <laughs> you know yeah. the, these characters and so you know while while i grew up a big kirby fan i kind of i like these guys as well they all had their strengths you know mm -hmm. um you know like a steve ditko or 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 somebody and uh uh yeah it was just stuff that i could I could really, I started to really relate to, like, I like the way this guy makes these people move. I like the way when he makes them talk, they're not talking about really much of anything, but they're, but they're just so alive. They just seem so human, you know, mm -hmm. doing this. and that really attracted me, you know, to create my own characters. Yeah. yeah it's funny. After I, after I did hear you say Harry Lucy, I went and got the Harry Lucy book the Archie book that you did the forward for. And I could totally see like, cause I was looking for the influence, you know? So like I could kind of pinpoint, and I definitely see what you mean about the movement of the characters. Like it felt, you could feel it across the page, you know? Yeah. Um, like uh, before Dan DiCarlo died, um, I got to talk to him a couple of times at comic conventions. And um, I remember I told him, you know, I, I really liked what you and Harry Lucy were doing. And he goes, yeah, he goes, Harry, I leaned on him when I came to Archie. I kind of learned how to do the Archie style and stuff and through him. And and he said, that guy, that guy could take the dumbest little story and just make it so entertaining, you know, because the story wasn't really about much of anything. Archie wanted to date Veronica, but Reggie was in the way, you know. Yeah, your usual stuff. But he just had a really real flair of making these characters alive and making these silly stories just really entertaining. And that's what I yeah. like. You know? Yeah, it's funny, too, because, like, I read Archie as a kid, but I can definitely see the differences, not just in their clothing, because obviously as the generations go, they change the clothing and modernize it a little bit. But I could definitely see the difference um, in that Archie illustrations as opposed to more of the modern stuff, you know? Right. Um, I was also wondering, are there any other artistic influences that were v that you uh, really drew from in your formative years that be besides these two people that I mentioned? Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, Kirby was a huge influence. And um, yeah, Cur Kirby was a big influence, um, you know, because he there was something real uh, special, obviously, about him, you know, um, 
which most people know. <laughs> uh, I like I like Ditko, you know, uh, um, of the two of the Marvel guys. I let, those were my favorites, um, you know, and I like I I picked from a lot of other like artists. You know, I grew up in the 60s, so I, I got I got the when Marvel was just starting and then I uh, and then uh, what DC was doing. And a lot of these artists who are dead now, <laughs> you know, but but um, I was really influence you know some drop you know as i got older some of them didn't didn't last with me you know it was kind of like well i kind of i still kind of like the way he draws but there's just something that doesn't stick um let's see uh you know and then i like a lot of the uh grew up on a lot of like comic strips like chester Gould doing dick tracy and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Roy Crane. Um, you guys were just really good cartoonists. They just knew how to to move you from from a panel to panel, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, that's what stuck with me. You know, they just could. They just made your eye just go bam, blam, blam, blam across the page. And they, and I think that's. I find that really cool about comics. You know, is is the way they they you're you're trapped in there <laughs> yeah. you know i i mean i definitely feel that come across in your work i mean i i'm a little late to the party let me just i'll, I'll be honest my my little brother who i got into comics was I, and i knew about love and rockets but i just didn't pick it up he's like you have to do it you have to read it and he said start with this and he gave me maggie the mccann you know and i couldn't stop I just I fell in love with the characters from from the get go, man, and completely changed my outlook, you know, on comics. While I did read a lot of independent stuff, Love and Rockets, especially your work, because I read yours first. I read it in or like all of yours, and I went to Gilbert's. Really changed my reading habits, right? So I was wondering, when do you remember the moment when you stopped reading some of the Marvel DC stuff and started discovering maybe some of the underground stuff, some of the indie stuff or if that maybe that was always a part of your reading i'm not sure right right well uh when like the uh, you know before before there was an alternative movement you know before there was an independent movement there were just comics here and there um that were uh, being self-published you know um the underground comics of the 60s and 70s you know um you know and i remember the only underground com uh mainstream comics was Cerebus and ElfQuest, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there wasn't really a, a an alternative scene when we started. Um, a lot of that stuff, yeah, uh, I grew up with, but, but, you know, I was still a kid when the undergrounds came out. So mm -hmm. my brothers liked them, but I was kind of like, oh, these are dirty comics. <laughs> so it took me it took me a while you know as i got older then i got into them but you know at first i was like like they're not in color you know that kind of thing you know <laughs> but um but it was uh the thing that that turned me uh over was i just kind of like you know we grew up i'm not trying to put this down because it's it's what i grew up with but um by the late, the mid and late seventies, um, the the only thing you could get was Marvel or DC. That's all there was, you know. So you didn't have much have much of a chance to uh, to to branch out, you know. And um, I started to like like, well, I'm gonna just buy a couple of Marvel titles, you know by X-Men or whatever, you know, or something. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, and I was looking, going back to look at older comics like the Archies and Dennis the Menace and being an older kid, like an older teenager, I started to um, like really discover like what these artists were doing. You know, as a kid, I just thought it was just fun stuff, you know, but right. I was going, going this guy this guy i didn't know who harry Lucy what didn't know harry lucy's name but i just remember going why do i keep going back to these archie comics why do why this artist this guy was my favorite you know and i just had this kind of late teenager revelation pre-11 rockets post high school 
you know, where I have no future, kind of like, what am I going to do with my life? And I just had this this new fascination with, like, going back and, and seeing, why did I like this? What was it that, that just attracted me? And it just started to grow. And it started to um, just, like, like uh, I don't know, like, like, oh, this is what I like. I like draw- writing stories like this guy. I, I like doing this so just things started to change and then when uh, and then punk came along late 70s for me mm-hmm. and it was kind of like what do i need comics for man <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. so comics kind of took a back seat to mm-hmm. to my punk world and it was like just eye opening i was perfect i was 18 or 19 you know it was just perfect mm-hmm. um uh my whole life was new you know like I changed my hairstyle, changed my clothes, you know, and, uh, but, you know, I still liked comics too, but then I started going like, okay, these characters I have, I'm going to cut her hair, you know, I'm going to give her uh, boots now, I'm going to, you know, I just started to put my punk influences in the comic, and, because at first Maggie was just a space mechanic, you know, just didn't have anything to her look. But then I went, well, why don't I put, give her a punk clothes? Well, oh, this and that. But then I started to go like, okay, why don't I have them go to gigs? Why don't I, I have her go to shows? Uh, why don't I, you know, and that's when the real life stuff started to take over, you know. Mm-hmm. It was like, it was like, um, like, oh, I'm having more fun going to shows than going to the comic store. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's kind of like that. And, uh, but, um, so that's kind of how it, how it changed. I just started to think like, wow, my my kind of real life is, is a little more fun than what I'm reading, you know? So that's why it kind of, I kind of went that way. And I thought, hey, we'll put it in, we'll put it in uh, comics because nobody else is doing it. You know, nobody's, or if they try to do a punk comic, it's done by 40 year old men who don't know what the hell punk is, you know? And, and I go, well, let's just try to do it as as uh, authentic as we can, you know, like and and so that's kind of how how things kind of evolved. You know, it was just uh, it, it was it was kind of timing because it was like, well, comic most people in comics really don't know what this stuff is. So let's put this in. Let's put let's put in uh, let's put in uh, um, gay people because nobody's talking about that in comics. No, you know, let's put uh, you know people of color because nobody nobody in, <laughs> in comics is of color, you know. And so uh, that's that's kind of it was kind of like just taking advantage of of stuff we know. And we got this whole canvas to just throw all this shit in, you know. Wow. And and so it, it was just it was good timing. I, I would say a lot of it was timing because of the time it was like things were turning over, you know, and we were right there. You know? Yeah, you guys were definitely like going back and looking at the year that these were made so ahead of your time. You know what I mean? And and it's just, it's insane to look at them now. And and that's the cool thing about it is like, it's it's not forced, right? It just feels natural. It's not like you're like, oh, hey, this person's gay. No, that's just, that's just who she is. And it just happens to be a part of her. You know, it's not like you make a big deal to say something, right? And that's, that's really where the magic is for me and these books and, and why I feel, probably why so many other people, countless other people feel so connected to them. I, I've definitely heard and I can see why that a lot of people say love and rockets is a huge reason for a lot of female readership in comics you know and bringing them in because like the main characters are women and they're written in a way that doesn't it's not um I don't want to say derogatory but you know what I mean like they're just they're women you know what I mean you don't over accentuate things they're real people you know and I was wondering what was the decision behind that to have women as your lead characters um, I guess it started with liking to draw women. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, 
and by by uh, that time, by punk days and stuff, I had a lot of women friends. You know, in high school, I didn't know any women. I was just too scared to talk to women. But um, by this time, I had a lot of women friends, and they were just really funny, funny people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I hate to make like they're a separate thing, but but um, you know, and uh, and uh, you know, goes back. I used to like better Veronica comics. You know, I, I like. They're just friends hanging out, um, and I thought, well, maybe I'll make my Maggie and Hopi, my my grown up uh, Betty and Veronica, you know. Um, and I just I just ended up liking to draw women. I like to, I mean, write women. I I I I, I liked uh, doing stories about them. I don't know what it is. I mean, I don't know why and i don't know why i was successful either you know i mean i just did my best um and another thing was like i said before it's kind of like well why don't we make the women the main characters in this comic i don't see that a lot of that out there i mean i remember i remember reading x-men comics and and all the girls liked each other you know they were all friends uh-huh. and and i just thought well, shit, yeah, that's you, you can do that. You know, it's it's cool, and you know the the secret behind it. I don't know. You know, I just tried it. I did my best. I made mistakes. I I did some good things. You know, but I uh, uh, the bottom line is I like women and I I like writing them and and drawing. Them, you know, and the first day a woman told me that she liked the way I write women. Mm. I just go, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> I've arrived. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I don't know. It, yeah, it just, uh, there's a million answers, but the bottom line is I just like doing it and I and I do yeah. my best. You know? I think you do a fantastic job, man. It's it, it, it just they have authentic voices. You know, that I think that's probably what shines through the most also about, especially those two. Not just, well, all of them, but Maggie and Hopi. I mean, they're my sure. favorites too, you know. Sure. I, I also was wondering, you know, it's interesting that you let your characters age. It's rare in comics when you see that, you know. I mean, I right now off the top of my head, I can only think of two, which would be Cerebus by Dave Sim and Savage Dragon by Eric Larson. Other than that, characters do not age, and I think that... That's something that is unique and also allows the readers to grow with the characters. So was that one of the main reasons why you chose to do it? Or like, was it even like you weren't thinking about it and it just kind of like happened as it did? Gilbert and I used to talk about how it started because Gilbert liked this old comic strip called Gasoline Alley, which was a strip about aging. Because, I mean, it started off with a guy finding a baby on his doorstep and raising the kid. And then the kid got older and older and they, and it grew with real time. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, that was one of the reasons, but I think another reason was just that we were always, I don't know, uh, sentimental kids thinking about the past stories, your grandparents told you, your mom told you, uh, you know, and so there's this past, and if you start, if you age the characters, they just have more, more to them because you knew them as. I mean, I you knew Maggie as a 17 year old, and then you now you know her in her 50s. You know, so there is a kind of like you kind of, I don't know. It's kind of like you just you just know them. And and you've lived with them, and so that just, I just think that brings the reader cr- closer, you know. And I don't know, it ju- it just seemed to work. And we didn't have the pressure of of having monthly comics like, you know, okay, the Human Torch is a teenager in high school. Now he's going to college. Uh oh, twenty years later, he's still in college. <laughs> you know, you know, mm-hmm. we didn't have that. We didn't have that trap where, you know, so Marvel characters are constantly getting younger and then they're getting older and then they're getting younger, you yeah. know, and it's all it's all mixed up. For us, we just got to take our time, you know, and uh, like the 
the older, knew the older Maggie got, you know, and I knew that she had to, okay, she's now in her 40s. Okay, what what was I like then? Or what, you know? Uh, you know, and so I, I kind of treat it that way. And I try my best because, you know, our comic does move slower than real time. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I have to jump five years ahead because time time is going faster than me. And I'm like, wait, Maggie's going to be 50. I'm not done with her being 40. You know, that, that kind yeah. of so So it's it's a little tricky. But I think. I think it works to get let to know the characters, you know, better. Mm-hmm. I mean, you say like you don't have the pressure of the monthly, you know, having to do these every month. Editorially, Gary Groth has edited the book from the beginning. Is that correct? Uh, now Eric Reynolds is our our editor now. Uh, okay, I, but... I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, does did Gary or does Eric like they kind of let you? I mean. You, they kind of let you guys do your thing, correct? Like they don't, they don't really like ever try to steer you a certain way. So that's also probably one of the blessings of you get to do exactly what you want to do, how you want to do it, right? Yeah, and they early on they <clears throat> they trusted that Gilbert and I were good self editors. We didn't <laughs> let ourselves get too far in one direction. That we kind of knew how to keep it. You know, everybody happy, <laughs> us and the reader and the publisher, <laughs> you know. And then I wanted to ask, too, besides Maggie and Hopi, who are some of your favorite characters to write? I really like, well, I like I like the character Ray, Maggie's boyfriend. Um, but I mean, uh, even when when I don't like them as people, you know, mm-hmm. there's there's times where I don't like them as personalities. Yeah. Like, uh, like um uh, I had trouble with Hopi about 10 years ago. And I was like, I don't even like her anymore. But I I realized I was thinking about her like a real person. You know, so I go, okay, so it's not that I'm, it's not that I'm, I'm doing, I'm writing her badly. It's just that I just think she's rotten right now. (laughs) So I got to figure out how to do this. But other characters, let's see. Um, I really like doing the Frogmouth, Vivian. Uh, because uh, Maggie, someone like Maggie has too much of a conscience and she would, she won't let herself get in trouble too much. Uh, the frog mouth can get in trouble all she wants. I get to, she can open her mouth and say the stupidest things and it works. You know, mm-hmm. I, I really like that about, about that character. She's, uh, she's so wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but works perfectly. You know, as a character uh, I, of the newer of the newer characters, I like uh, her little sister Donta. I like uh, I kind of like that I'm I'm using a younger character because um, in your younger days, in your early twenties, late teens, you're a lot freer. Uh, Mag- Maggie now has to live with the fact that she's like a grown up and and. And doesn't want to go out to a club, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Too tired to, yeah. to do something <laughs> like that. And if she did, it would be a whole different experience than it would for, like, say, a tonta who I can make her just go bonkers, you know. And uh, so I'm having fun with tonta a lot. Um, she's kind of struggling having a, a living with a really dysfunctional family and trying to be. Like I'm a good person, but but I keep screwing up because I'm part of this family, and I I really like doing that. Um, I like I like all the characters. Uh, it's just uh, a lot of them run out of stories. That's uh-huh. why you don't see a lot of them a lot of times. Like like why don't you do uh, Terry more often? The uh, her musical career, and it's like I got nothing to to really to tell about her. You know, and then something will come up and I go, oh, good, I got to do Terry again. You know, it's it, it's kind of like my characters are like standing in a waiting room waiting for me. And I come and go, OK, I got a new issue to do. Which one of you has a story for me? And then <laughs> one of them raise, raise their hand and go, I got a great one. And I'll go, cool, come on. 
The rest of you can have to, have to wait. You know, it, it's whoever whoever gives me a good story because you know, even if we're not uh, on that monthly schedule, we still want to keep coming out pretty regularly. And I can't wait to have a genius story for a character that doesn't have a story. You know, so it's the ones that speak to me the most. You know. Yeah, and is that how you stay so like? still like after like almost 40 years maybe a little over 40 years you still say so excited about the books because you have this large cast and you can pick and choose and is yeah. that also why you'll create new characters to kind of keep it fresh yeah yeah and 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 i and i've create so many characters that that if i go blank on ones I, one will always save me you know? <laughs> and i try to make them all you know different personalities it's not yeah it's not always that easy, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, oh, I, gr I created this new character who I really like. And I go, oh, she's just a rehash of, of these other two characters, you know, so you disguise it like, well, uh, she's six foot tall instead of five foot tall, you know, <laughs> things like that, you know, so you got to use little tricks like, okay, but that one had light colored hair. This one will have dark colored hair and green eyes instead of brown eyes, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a kind of, it's kind of a, a juggling act, you know, and to try to, to convince the reader that these are all different people when I really only have like four personalities to work with out of a hundred characters, you know, yeah. so it's a, like a, it's just kind of a fun uh, juggling act, you know. And yeah, and you said you, you draw and you have drawn in the past um, from real life experiences and real people. Do you still continue to do that or have the characters kind of dictated themselves through the years how you write them and you don't necessarily draw still from real people? Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of the characters tell me what to, <laughs> what to do. You know, uh, like Maggie writes herself, Hopi writes herself, you know. The mm -hmm. the one the characters I know the best write themselves and it's almost like I have no no power other than to follow like okay where are you taking me you know and then they get stuck in a problem and I'm the one who has to get them out of it you know that kind of thing uh -huh. you know I, it <clears throat> I know it's it's lines on paper but I have to treat them like they're my neighbors in order for to get the results, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And has there ever been a moment where you thought about doing something else, or is this the only thing you want to do for the rest of your career? I've I've always just wanted to draw comics, you know. Mm -hmm. That's that's my favorite thing to do. You know, I'm not as fast as I used to be, you know, um, uh, the ideas don't come as quick, but, but um, it's still something I really enjoy. And as long as I have a fan base, no matter how small, <laughs> you know, I, I, I still want to do comics. I've dabbled in kind of getting the stuff, uh, you know, adapted, you know, done mm -hmm. the Hollywood, Hollywood talks and stuff, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't pan out and I think because this stuff is just I'm too protective you know of this stuff and I say never say never but it so far it hasn't worked out and I get tired of of going through the the meetings you know uh -huh. because I hear the same things over and over and it's like it's like uh we we love your characters we like this guy and I go oh you like the white guy out of all these, <laughs> all these people of color, you like the white guy because he's the one you can handle. You know, sometimes it's that, and I'm like, so Maggie and Hopi become become a background for this one guy or or, or something. You know, that's not always the case, but um, sometimes you know, it's it's a uh, it's just hard, and and like I said, I'm real protective of it, so I get real frustrated, and I and then I quit. You know, like uh, I don't. Want this anymore you know um i'm also spoiled i'm my own boss you know and, <laughs> and in hollywood you have 20 bosses you know? <laughs> yeah or maybe even more 
you know, um, some people can do it. I, I, I find it really hard to, uh, to, to do that kind of stuff. Um, as far as other stuff, you know, I've just things like I've always wanted to be a painter, but you know, I don't, I'm too lazy to learn <laughs> kind of thing. Uh -huh. You know, I haven't painted since high school, that kind of thing, <laughs> you know, uh, but, um, or if someone said, have you ever thought about writing an actual novel? And they go, no, I like pictures. I like to draw, you know, mm -hmm. so comics is the perfect, it's got all the ingredients that I want, you know, that's why I keep going back to it. And I, I don't know, I, I figured, so I draw comic books for my whole life. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <You know. laughs> yeah, that's a dream for me. Um, and I can understand your protectiveness over your characters because we see the bad adaptations of once great stories and Hollywood butchers them. You know, I mean, there's no other way to say it. So please be protective of them. Don't ever, <laughs> don't ever not be protective. You know, and, you know, speaking of like, you know, doing comics, you know, Gilbert's done stuff outside of love and rockets mm -hmm. i know i've seen covers by you i've looked for other stuff I, I not that i've been able to see but have you thought about doing other projects or for um, other publishers or do you only want to do your your own work um i i would like to i am just not the machine gilbert is mm -hmm. gilbert gilbert's a madman he'll he'll create three things at once and I can barely get an issue of Love and Rockets out. You know, I just don't have that thing he has of like, okay, I'm going to do this series for this company. I'm going to do this mini series. I wouldn't know how to begin. You know, <laughs> I I just put all my eggs in one basket. You know, um, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I just don't have that that um, drive he has and and. Gilbert has always been a great idea person. And you want me to come up with a series? And then I ask them, what's it going to be about? And they go, well, you're doing it. And I'm like, I, I don't know what you, I don't know what this is going to be about. You know, yeah. so, so yeah, yeah. I, I, I do, uh, I do this comic because I don't think very, I don't think outside of it, um, yeah. creative wise. You know. Okay. Everybody it, like loves loves your stuff, right? Nobody. I never heard a bad thing. Like I said to you earlier, right? Are you ever self-critical of yourself? Still knowing the success that you've had, do you still find yourself being overly critical of your own stuff and thinking maybe, oh man, I don't, I don't think this is great. But then somebody else will be like, that's amazing. Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm my biggest critic. You know, um, um yeah. Uh, uh, I'm constantly loving and then hating and then loving and then hating an issue, you know, every issue I do. And I've, I've realized I don't think I can finish an issue without doing that, you know, so I'm really hard on, on getting this right. And I know every issue can't be the perfect one, but I know it, it'll do for now till that one comes. Very self-critical. Of my work, and, and uh, sometimes I wonder, am I going in the wrong direction? I can't worry about that, you know. Yeah. No, you're not. You're not. How it how it turns out, you know. I I I I don't. I try not to sit around and worry about this stuff because the stuff will never come out, you know. What What are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned in in your career? I'm lucky that I chose the right ones <laughs> for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, like, uh, I never thought outside of it. I never thought like this should be, this should be more like this than what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. you know, I never, I never really thought about turning it around and making, making a big move and then totally failing, you know, um, so uh I don't know, as much as as much as I, I try to put out the best material, I I kinda don't uh take big chances as far as uh something that's just gonna bite me in the ass, you know. 
big uh-huh. time and I wasted three years, you know, kind of uh, thing. Um, uh, the biggest lessons um, is that that I was lucky that like, oh, good, I was right. This works best for me. This, uh-huh. this uh, and just learning that that, oh, if you just keep it keep it at your pace your your personal what you're allowed to to produce mm-hmm. you know it keep it within your uh, little explosion your <laughs> your thing that's uh, that's what I learned about myself I couldn't tell a, another person I my advice was just just like oh, just do it <laughs> you, know? Yeah. you know it's great just trust yourself it'll be fine I mean, little things like, you know, oh, maybe I shouldn't have, uh, maybe I shouldn't have, uh, you know, put so much crosshatch in that one story, you know, <laughs> just, just uh, stupid stuff like that, you know, but, but nothing, nothing big, like, that just kind of destroyed me, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I, I wanted to ask, um, you know, punk was early in, the, in those early days, but it, does music still play a large part in, in your life? Not as much as it used to, you know. I'm not as hungry as I used to be, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, I'll still listen to some old punk, but but um, I don't really get into newer bands, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, I was a lot hungrier back in my youth, you know, and 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 uh, now now it's kind of like. What do I got? And I'll throw a CD on. You know, I still got, I still have CDs. <laughs> yes, <they're> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I won't buy anything else other than CDs. So, yeah. And and uh, music plays less because uh, because now I'm uh, uh, my the way I I do my comic has shifted where I used to write it and then. Uh, and then start putting it down pencils and stuff. And I used to be able to uh, blast music um, because I wasn't writing, you know, because when I'm writing, everything has to be off, you know, turned off. Mm -hmm. Um, Then I used to be able to like, just put on music and while I was penciling and inking and stuff like that. And it was great. Now the way it's turned out is I draw, write and draw at the same time. So there's a lot, less music time for me because I'm writing and editing and, and, and as I'm drawing and penciling, you know, uh, uh-huh. it just, it just evolved that way. Uh, not, it wasn't a big plan. It just turned out that way. And I realized I don't get to listen to music a lot anymore. Like I used to, you know, it's a shame because I used to love those times when I go, okay, the thing is written time to just go to town and I would just yeah. blast music all night while I was working. You know? oh, that's awesome. And I kind of miss that. I kind of miss that because it's a lot less than it used to be. And, and are you reading anything currently? Any cartoonists that you're like really excited about that you'd like to share with us? The, you know, myself, the listeners. Right. Um, gee, I'm going to go blank. Let me see if I have like, let me go through a list. Oh, okay. okay. I'll wait. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, right now, that's uh, yeah. There, there's uh, there's some cartoonists. Um, you know, I hate to I hate to mention them because they're good friends. You know, yeah. So, uh, so I'm playing favorites and stuff like that. You know, like I like. Uh, do you know the the artist Helen Joe? No. Yeah. She well, she doesn't do a lot of comics uh but she does a lot of art and stickers and and stuff like that and uh, i really like her a lot um i like katie skelly but she's a really good friend so that's not yeah (laughs) yeah um i uh i like uh you know liz suburbia Uh, it sounds familiar but i don't yeah she does she does punk comics i like i like the way she draws yeah um let's see i'm looking I wrote down stuff because I knew I would forget. You know Eric Haven? He no. Does, yeah. Man, I'm missing out on a lot of stuff here. I'm going <laughs> to go look, look this up when I get off. 
Yeah, he's he's real. I really love it. He's just crazy. You know, his comics are just nuts. Uh, yeah, I like Eleanor Davis. She does. Oh really yeah, awesome. she's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, man, can she draw? Um, you know, um, I like Gilbert. Obviously, seeing so, yeah, Sam so just playing favorites. You know, um, there's some there's a uh, some artists like there was this one. This one woman who I really liked their stuff, but she just disappeared, fell off the face of the earth, named, Ra I don't know how you pronounce it, Rachel F Frieri, Fri or Friere. She, she was doing these, these comics, uh, these minis for a while, and I really thought she was a really talented artist, and uh, then she just disappeared, like, overnight, and I kind of curious what happened you know yeah and and it's um uh, and it's usually artists who who don't put out regular work so they're hard to find sometimes you know um but then uh you know i'm kind of i'm kind of not as hungry as i used to be so i don't i go to the comic store more often and leave without buying anything yeah. you know but i like to go and see what's new you know you know, and then I'll see like, oh, this is a good artist, but I kind of don't like what this comic's about or, you know, or something, you know. Uh -huh. um, so, I don't know. Um, so, uh, there you go. Yeah, um, no, that's that's great. I, I it, was, it was also more on a selfish note, too, because like, oh, right. I, I like to I like to hear what some of my favorite cartoonists are into. That way, maybe I discover something I never discovered before. Right. And so I, I'm definitely looking forward to looking into those. Um, I was wondering, what is currently on your drawing table? Uh, the next Love and Rockets. Um, I'm uh, in the middle of inking and and stuff, so I get to listen to music. <laughs> 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 but uh, um, yeah, right now Love and Rockets. I did a uh, I did a cover for for a friend for something, and then uh, just things here and there. Uh, do you know? Have you ever heard of stinkers? They're they're like a stickers that um, artists do, and they're okay. and uh, I'm I'm working with them to do a sheet of of, uh, of stinkers. Um, uh, just uh, small things here and there, you know. Um, but I uh, love rockets mostly. You know, I finish one, I start the next one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And when when will the next? Because I know you group them into hardcovers when they get collected. Do you know about when maybe the next collection, or how much more you have left of the story to be collected in that? Yeah, um, I'm still working on some of the stories, so I don't know when they'll be collected. But okay. I'm wrapping up. I'm wrapping up uh, one of the storylines, and that that will be a collection. Or I hope it will be, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, and uh, but I'm in the middle of uh, since I had two collections last year. Yeah, uh, I I'm kind of catching up, and there won't be collections for a while. But but um, hopefully, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of collections, um, you know, with such a long history of Love and Rockets, I was wondering if you could. I already know which way to read it. I've, I've read it all. So, but I was wondering if you could share with the viewers, maybe that haven't read some of it yet. What is the, in your opinion, the best way for them to jump into Love and Rockets? Ooh, um, I used to like damage my brain over this, but now I just say, just jump in, just jump in um, any any place, and the rest will fall into place because mm -hmm. you're going like, like. I kind of like this character, but I don't really know who she is. Well, if you like her enough, you'll go back and you'll and you'll find it. You know, um, I used to say start from the beginning, but you know, a lot of people go, well, then I take me forever to catch up, blah blah blah. And I'm like, so now I just say, just jump in. If you like what you see, then you'll know there was more. You know, there's more that you can find you know uh i don't know you know people will go like well when i do that i don't like 
I don't know the characters. And I go, well, when you find when you open an issue one of something, you don't know the characters. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, just jump on, jump in feet first, and hopefully you'll like something you see. In it. Yeah, awesome. And uh, one more Maggie Healthy question: Do you have an end in mind for for those characters? Um, the only thing I have is old age, meaning like one day someone will be grow older than the other, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, I'm, I'm 60 years old. So, so I'm not thinking of them in their eighties, but you know, one day, maybe, maybe someone will die next year, you know? Um, so I don't really have a, a, a set ending. I, I'm just going to do it as long as I can do it, and uh, as long as it doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then um, uh, another question before before I let you go, I was wondering if you could share one of the most memorable experiences that you've had in your career, just like a maybe just a, or a cool story that you could share with me. Oh, good. There's a lot of them. Um, course i'm gonna think of one and then after we hang up i'm gonna think oh i should have told him this one but you know what um meeting meeting old artists you know that aren't around anymore I, i'm old enough that i was able to meet some artists before they died like say jack kirby i got to go to his house once you know, that was that was pretty cool you know that's awesome you know i didn't uh you know i was quiet most of the time because i didn't want to ruin it and get <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was that was pretty cool. You know, when you're in the house and you're like talking to him and they're talking like like he's just old guy, you know, talking about the war, World War Two, and then you stop and go like, I'm talking to Jack Kirby, man. Wow, you know, you know, something like that. You know, I've met you know people like Mobius and oh and my god, and, so cool, and, like that. You know, most of it was small talk though because you're at a convention, you know. And, mm-hmm. And you just say hi and and then exchange like, oh, I like your work. Oh, I like your work. Uh, you know, stuff like that. But it's still pretty cool, you know, that I, I and and partly sad because you go, wow, a lot of people are not here anymore that I mm-hmm. that I used to just see walking the floor at San Diego or something, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure I'll think of other really good stories <laughs> uh, after we hang up. But but. Yeah, um, I guess most of it is just seeing seeing a lot of the old guys when they were still around, you know, and and get, getting to shake their hand at, at least, <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't know. I uh, I got to. <clears throat> this is a smaller one, but I got to meet Ramona Fraden um, when uh, she was still doing San Diego Artist Alley, and. Mm-hmm. I got to tell her, like, well, I've been a friend of yours since you did Metamorpho, you know. And, she, and she's all just kind of nodding like another fanboy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm just going, yeah, 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 those are pretty cool. Uh, uh, you know, I didn't know what to say. Yeah. Uh, you know, but uh, I don't know. It, it's, just, it's just all cool anyway, you know, I get to. Yeah. When you get to meet your old heroes. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'll say it. I'm jealous. You know, I'm jealous of those people <laughs> you got to meet for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, I just want to once again, I want to thank you for taking time out to do this. It has been a pleasure and an honor. Yeah, uh, can you share where uh, everybody that's watching can find you online? Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, just find me, Jaime Hernandez. Um, you know, a lot of times I don't do comic stuff. I take a picture of my cat, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can do that. You know, um, I still have email Hernandez bro at, at uh, gmail.com. Um, I, I probably won't answer because I just <laughs> read it and then I put it aside. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Awesome, man. Well, once again, thank you so much. I'll drop the links to your stuff down below, and it's been it's been a pleasure, man. I hope we can do this again sometime. Yeah, this one for having me on. That, that was cool. 
lounge and sun.